Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to those of you online and to those of you here in our offices. My name is Mara Policelli. I'm the executive director of the University of Notre Dame's Keough School of Global Affairs, Washington, D.C. office. So welcome to all of you, especially many of our students who are spending their spring break here in Washington with us. Uh, and we're happy to have you all, both our graduate students and some undergraduate students uh, here today. So we have this space here in Washington, D.C. for exactly uh, the purpose of today's event. Um, we're here as a outpost of the university, a place where we can have policy conversations, connect our students and faculty uh, with the vibrant international community that is Washington, D.C. So I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, uh, who is basically at the heart of the Keough School's uh, efforts to intersect policy with practice, policy with evidence-based research. And I'm really thrilled that he's here. So I'm gonna turn things over to Professor Josh Eisenman. His expertise is in international political economy and Chinese politics. He has published widely on US-China relations, China's relationship with developing countries, and specifically uh, China-Africa relations. Professor Eisenman received his PhD at, in political science from UCLA, his master's in international relations from Johns Hopkins University of uh, School of Advanced International Studies here in Washington, and his BA in East Asian Studies from the George Washington University's Elliott School of International Affairs. So we're thrilled to be hosting him and his esteemed panel today, and I'll turn things over to Professor Eisenman. Hi, thanks, Maura. Really appreciate it. Looking out at this room, I think that I can finally say COVID looks like it's over. That's good. Um, so, as Maura said, welcome you all to our office here in Washington, D.C. And I want to thank Maura and uh, uh, Carla and Josh Stowe, who's here somewhere, for all of their hard work on this uh, panel. I really appreciate it, and it couldn't have happened without them. Also want to recognize the uh, China Global South Initiative, uh, which we have uh, through the Pulte Institute. Um, and who is also supporting this event. Um, and of course, our friends at USIP who supported the report. Um, and so we're, we're really grateful to have such great partners here. And I am thrilled that we have an all-star cast for you here today. What I'm gonna do here is so we don't take any of our time later introducing people, I'm just gonna introduce them all to you so you're all familiar. First, uh, here in the front row is uh, Professor Anita Plummer, who is Assistant Professor in the Department of African Studies here at Howard University in Washington. And she is Associate Director of Research and Faculty Engagement for the Center for Women, Gender, and Global Leadership. Her new book, just out, right? Brand new, off the shelf, right? I think in November, right? Is called Kenya's Engagement with China, Discourse, Power, and Agency. It was published by Michigan State uh, University Press, <clears throat> and there's one thing that I can mention about Professor Plummer that I don't think is on her website or mine, which is that I was her TA, actually, many years ago at UCLA. Uh, she was a visiting professor, and I was a TA for, guess which class? China-Africa relations, right? Um, so it's just fantastic to see her again after so many years. Um, two down from her, we have uh, Ellie Young. Ellie is a research analyst uh, for China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan at Freedom House and she works on the Beijing Global Media Influence Project um, and contributes to the China Media Bulletin and the Hong Kong Media Bulletin. And she was a co-author of the uh, Beijing Global Media Influence Report 2022 titled Authoritarianism, Expansion, and the Power of Democratic Resilience. So you can see that their research is precisely the kind of expertise we need. Here uh, we have uh, uh, Henry Tugendhat, uh, who is with the China team at the USIP, US Institute of Peace and runs their China, Africa, and China, Latin America programs. He focuses um, on issues related to China's impact and conflict in these two areas. And Henry has worked for a variety of institutions, in call, including the Institute for Development Studies in the UK and the China Africa Initiative at my alma mater, Johns Hopkins University, which he is also attending, and at the World Bank uh, a Group of Microeconomics Trade and Investment. So welcome, Henry. And then finally, last but not least, and our next speaker, my old friend, mentor, and I would call exemplar, Derek uh, Mitchell, Ambassador Derek Mitchell, uh, who is the president of the National Democratic Institute. 
Um, and from 2012 to 2016, Ambassador Mitchell served as a U.S. ambassador to Myanmar. Um, and prior to that appointment, he served as principal deputy assistant secretary of defense for East Asia, excuse me, for Asia and Pacific Affairs in the office of the secretary of defense. And in that capacity was responsible for overseeing the defense department's security policy in Asia. And for his work, he won the award from the office of the secretary of defense for the distinguished public service in 2011. Prior to that, in 2001 to 2009, Ambassador Mitchell, well, not then Ambassador Mitchell, worked as senior fellow and director of Asia Division at CSIS, think tank down the street. And that's actually when I met Ambassador Mitchell, when I was working on the Hill and he was working in that capacity. Prior to that, 1997 to 2001, he served as special assistant for Asia and the Pacific in the office of the Secretary of Defense and was the principal author for the 1998 East Asia Strategy Report. Um, and which was the last such report produced by DOD. I think that's still right. But again, one thing I don't think you'll probably see on his CV was this book that we did together in 2007, China in the Developing World, Beijing Strategy for the 21st Century. And I think just by looking at this book, you can get a sense of how much has changed since 2007, right? You're looking at a book with a two-tone cover and about the shabbiest index you could find because the press didn't think this was a topic that people would be very interested in at the time. And we can really see how this has evolved. Um, you, and, uh, you know, we, we did a book uh, 10 years ago, and, and that book just received so much more attention. Um, and there's a lot of copies that have, uh, uh, what is, imitators have come out, but nothing, in my opinion, better than the original. Um, so uh, Ambassador Mitchell has been working on this topic for years, and he wrote, um, I think, what the introductory chapter for the book. So he's um, specifically uh, well attuned for this topic and has been working on it for a long time. So without any further ado, please put your hands together and welcome Ambassador Derek Mitchell. Sorry if I leave this yeah. well, thank you very much, Josh, for that generous introduction. It really is great to see you. I want to thank Notre Dame for inviting me. Uh, Maura, thank you very much. Um, I do want to congratulate you for the remarkable achievements. I mean, that book, can't, it's hard to believe it's been 20 years since we met and about 15 years since that book came out. Um, you know, it, we were quite prescient, I think. Uh, and a lot of what's happened since may not really surprise us, but I think it surprised a lot of other people because it really wasn't mainstream thinking back then about what China was doing around the world and why we should be paying attention to it. Um, China, uh, there's a sequel to that book, China Steps Out, that uh, you put out about five years ago, um, which is kind of an update. And then I know you have a China Africa book that you put out early in the decade. And I talked to a good friend of mine who's a leading Africanist, and he said that China Africa book really is not just the seminal work, but truly still the standard for that. And I just found out back here, he will show you a cover to their follow up to that on China Africa. So I would call that the way of water, maybe like your you know, updated sequel, uh, hopefully even now doing the original. Um, but I want to congratulate you, Josh, first of all, on the report and congratulate USIP for securing Josh to do it. You couldn't have found, found a better person to be involved. As noted, um, while I've spent most of my career working on Asia with a particular focus on China, I am now president of an organization that works with a broad network of partners uh, around the world to support those struggling to develop and defend democracy in their countries around the world. NDI, National Democratic Institute, has more than 55 offices globally at the moment including 15 or so in Africa. Our offices everywhere are staffed almost entirely by non-Americans, and our programs focus on sharing democratic experiences and programs with other, and practices with others so they can learn lessons and do better. Democracy, after all, is always a work in progress. We know as Americans, mostly probably Americans here, democracy is a work in, prog in, in progress uh, and something that we can all benefit from by learning our lessons. But I'm quite aware, we are quite aware, that a growing headwind to our work to help Africans and others to realize their democratic aspirations, their desire for individual rights and personal dignity, for transparent, accountable, inclusive, and representative government, is the increase of malign influence in these countries, often on behalf of corrupt, repressive rulers and elites. China, of course, is not the only country involved in this. Russia and some others come to mind. Nor would I contend that they are the primary driver of democracy's problems on the continent. But, 
as Josh outlines in the reporting you will hear later today, uh, China is applying substantial resources to put wind in the sails of illiberalism in Africa and elsewhere. They are actively shaping a world safe for autocracy and autocratic values because illiberalism works for them. Illiberalism works for them. That's because they believe there is no level playing field when it comes to their zero sum approach to international affairs and their competition with the United States and the West. Values of transparency, rule of law, and separation of powers do not work for them. Values of opacity, corruption, and information control do. Uh, of course, they couch their approach in high-minded rhetoric about common destinies and the like. Just yesterday, Xi Jinping's speech introducing his Global Civilization Initiative said China, and I quote here, carries forward the common values of all mankind, peace, development, fairness, justice, democracy, and freedom. Lovely, <laughs> lovely words, such noble, noble words. What possibly can be our concern about China then with that list? But of course, the Chinese Communist Party's definition of fairness, justice, and democracy, and freedom would make even an Orwellian blush. Alongside Russia, they are explicitly trying to redefine these terms, including the very concept of democracy. Just see, I mean, there are a number of examples, recent examples. I look back to the Russia-China statement last February, the one where they talked about you know, a, a, a alliance without limits. Uh, the first section of that statement last February was about democracy, the first section in which they defined, of course, they defined it to the point of incoherence in order to claim that both China and Russia were actually true democracies. Ironically, though, this fascinating desire to twist democracy's meaning only demonstrates just how powerful the idea of democracy is, even to the Chinese. And it shows, in fact, just how much they fear it. What do they fear? They fear the lack of control inherent in the concept, which is to say, free expression, free association, free media, independent thinking, objective facts, and individual opinions based on them. You know, real democracy. These are dangerous concepts for them at home and abroad. They fear the truth, including current truth and historical truth, which they term historical nihilism, because the truth often conflicts with the parties and the party leader's self-interest, which after all must be paramount. The truth must be censored or controlled. Everything must be controlled. Nothing must be left to chance. The CCP, of course, is not terribly interested in average citizens' interests, African or otherwise. I mean, they're fine with in in interest. They're not so interested, but they do care about public opinion and how publications and populations, if left to their own devices, uh, might form those opinions. They also care not to be an autocratic island in a sea of liberal or democratic societies that are operating on liberal principles worldwide. They feel more secure if they can reshape the global standards, empower the elites, embed authoritarian values, and together frame that as peace, justice, freedom, and democracy. And that, admittedly, along with a profit motive, is why they also enjoy exporting surveillance and, surve and censorship technologies worldwide. It is a dangerous vision for the 21st century. Now, we can dismiss the CCP's attempt to call themselves a true democracy is laughable, and we can assume that people around the world will know better. But as Josh notes in his report, we are complacent at our peril. When at the Pentagon, we used to talk about forward military presence as essential to shaping a peaceful security global environment. Likewise, we need to recognize the essential necessity of being forward deployed and thinking politically to shape global standards that work for all, not just a narrow few. And I point on that work for all, not just the narrow few, or not just the United States, but for all, not just a narrow few. In the process, though, we must react to the challenge with care. Josh will also be the first to tell you, I suspect, that, that China has longstanding ties to Africa and has invested substantial time and effort there for decades. That investment has paid off, at least at the elite level. They are also providing things Africa wants and needs, infrastructure, cheap exports, mobile phones, markets for their natural resources, and the like. All of this often comes at a steep price, which are initially opaque, but that citizens everywhere, including in Africa, are now beginning to understand. 
But ultimately, Africans, like others, will take what they can get if there are few alternatives. It is not enough to bemoan China's activity. Those who care about Africa must demonstrate consistent good faith interest in African development, African voice, and African interests over time. We hear much commentary about democracy's decline, but we see in country after country, including in Africa, that the demand for democracy remains strong. Democracy is not so much in decline as under attack from within and from outside. It is important to understand how it is coming under attack and why it matters and whether in fact these attacks are effective, why or why not, and never ever be complacent. That's why Josh's piece and others like it are so important. We need to be clear-eyed and should not lower ourselves to China's level, that is to bully, coerce, or censor, but play to America's advantage, which is our honest interest in the well-being of others, even as we pursue our own self-interest. We do better when others do better. We are more secure when others are more secure. We do not fear facts, truth, or honest debate, but embrace it as the best way for societies to thrive and peace to prevail. Given the world we face, we are at our strongest when we play to those innate instincts, which are at the heart of our soft power. As an Asianist, I'm really glad these days to hear the administration talk about how much of the 21st century history will be written in Asia. I've wanted that for so long, because it's always about Europe or the Middle East, it's great. But I have come to recognize that much of the history of the 21st century will be written in Africa due to the, dy due to the dynamism and demographics on the continent. Josh's piece enables us to understand better how an illiberal great power is trying to shape Africa's course in the 21st century. It's a window into how China will act elsewhere, as it is certain what they do in Africa will not stay in Africa. But Josh also offers a framework for how we and others may best help Africa's immensely diverse population maintain their ability to shape their own futures, free from information manipulation and coercion, protect their sovereignty and dignity, and ensure the continent develops to its full potential to the benefit of us all. Again, I congratulate Josh for an excellent and important report. I thank you, I thank USIP, I thank Notre Dame for allowing me the honor of saying a few words at the top of the program this afternoon. So thank you. All right, Henry, I guess that's the job of the MC. I'm gonna <laughs> shuffle you up here. But... Right, well, luckily I don't have to match, I'm not here to match the ambassador's depth of reflections uh, or uh, quality there, but I hope I can at least match his enthusiasm. So I'm just here to give some brief uh, uh, introductory remarks to the, uh, to the report, and then we're gonna kick off. But uh, firstly, I just wanna say thank you so much to Notre Dame University for hosting this launch of our latest uh, US Institute of Peace report. Uh, and thank you especially to Josh for all his great work on this valuable contribution. Uh, for those of you just getting to know us, uh, the U.S. Institute of Peace is a nonpartisan institution founded by the U.S. Congress and based here in Washington, D.C., down on the Mall. Uh, we are independent, which means we have no policy agenda driven by any incumbent government. Rather, we have a mandate to collaborate with our partners overseas to reduce the threat of conflict at the local and international levels. We believe that a world without conflict is possible, practical, and essential for both U.S. and global security. As part of this mandate, we will occasionally commission research that feeds into our programming. And Josh's paper here is the first in a series of papers we will be commissioning, uh, we will be publishing, sorry, this year, focused on Chinese engagements in Africa and Latin America. They cover loans backed weapons sales to Zambia, telecommunication strategies in Latin America, uh, private military education in East Africa, and more. The report that Josh has produced for us fits into this series in an important way. We know that words matter, perceptions matter, and information or disinformation can destabilize societies and international relationships. As China invests more resources in media influence campaigns in Africa, we want to understand what this means for US relations with, with its local partners and what can be done to address any threats posed by, the in, by incendiary narratives or languages. It is therefore with great pleasure that we get to launch this report at Josh's University here in Washington, D.C. And I'm now going to hand it over back to you to present some key findings of the report before we jump into the panel.
Well, that's great. Thank you so much, guys. I'm going to uh, give you guys a kind of once over lightly with regard to the report, and then we're going to turn to our panel as quickly as possible. Let me see here. Okay, great. So first, a bit of background. This report uh, was based on extensive field work conducted in China and in a uh, half dozen African countries between 2017 and 2020, uh, primarily with Ambassador David Shin, who is a former US ambassador to Ethiopia and Burkina Faso. Um, so this part, this report then is part of a larger assessment, which is uh, the book, uh, which Ambassador Mitchell mentioned a moment ago, which I'm gonna, I have actually, I can reveal to you if I find it here, the picture of the new cover. Here it is, brand new. Just released the cover of the new book. Um, I just found it online, so there it is. Um, and so this book deals with the entire kind of soup to nuts of the strategic relationship, including the, um, the, the security strategy as well as the political relations. And of course, there is a chapter on propaganda. And within that chapter, we cover three areas. One is, as you might guess, media propaganda, but we also cover educational propaganda as well as cultural propaganda. And so this report is in many ways an outgrowth of a larger uh, project, which has been kind of given uh, a kind of policy, uh, uh, if, uh, uh, I don't know what the right word is, but a policy impact, if you will, right? Um, and so it's also important to understand that propaganda uh, is only one part of China's larger soft engagement strategy, which is to say there are other ways that China engages Africa that are not hard security. For example, the party-to-party -party relationship. Uh, the Communist Party of China engages African political parties throughout the continent. China has what, it might, what we might call stadium or palace diplomacy, where it helps to build stadiums or different, uh, well, presidential palaces of, uh, of different uh, African leaders and other important, uh, um, easily recognized infrastructure. China also has extensive traditional diplomacy. Every year, the Chinese foreign minister's first visit is to Africa. Every year since the 80s, okay? So that means every year, the Chinese foreign minister is in Africa, and we're not even close to that. Um, one important note is the issue of the word propaganda, because the word propaganda in English comes with some baggage, I think we would all agree. But in China, the word propaganda, or at least according to the Communist Party of China, propaganda is not a dirty word. It is only one of many tools that they use to achieve their policy goals, right? So you would say there are several options, and propaganda is, as Henry said, one of those options because words matter. <clears throat> it's also important to recognize, and this was something that I want to thank USIP for their, for their efforts on, that we went back and forth a lot with regard to terminology, right? Trying to determine what are the right words to translate Chinese terms? What is the right way to articulate what China is doing in English when they themselves develop this strategy in Chinese, right? And so this is something where you can see at the front of the report, we have a whole section, a note on terminology. And that is in part, in, that is because of the hard work of USIP, who was very diligent in terms of making sure we were defining our terms properly, which as an academic, I certainly appreciate, right? So this report then is divided into three broad parts. The first part summarizes how Chinese leaders have increasingly come to consider developing countries and African countries in particular as partners in their efforts to secure what China calls its core national interests. And increasingly, as you heard from Xi Jinping a few days ago, disparage the United States. Second, the report identifies how China uses media propaganda to advance positive messaging to African audiences while enticing, cajoling and intimidating African journalists into towing the CPC's editorial line. And then third, the report talks about the effectiveness of Chinese propaganda in trying to try to measure the effectiveness using different metrics. And then fourth, it concludes with a set of policy recommendations for the U.S. government with how to address this issue. The U.S. has two primary concerns here. One is the U.S. being disparaged in this propaganda and how to respond to that. And the other is within this country, we value the fourth estate. We want the press to be a check on power. And so our goal is not to challenge Chinese propagandists head on, but rather to be a better United States in terms of the effort and the resources that we are putting into our engagement. So those are the three, uh, excuse me, four sections of the report. So if I could then, I want to just summarize some of the basic ideas here before we turn to our panel. I think it's important to begin with the idea that the, yeah, the global financial crisis had a large role 
in China being able to advance its media propaganda in Africa, because it was at this time when a lot of global media organizations pulled back from their reporting in localities in America, but also in Africa. They decided to cut bureaus. And it was at this time that China launched a campaign to expand its influence in Africa. While we were pulling back, they were pushing in, right? And this concept, and, and actually in this book, uh, Ambassador Mitchell talks about it in his chapter, of the strategic periphery around China has grown now to what China calls a da jobian or a big strategic periphery or a greater strategic periphery, which now includes parts of Africa, including Kenya. So we can see an evolution. And uh, Professor Yen Shui Tong at Tsinghua University described it, I think, very well when he said very succinctly, from 2012 to 2014, Chinese diplomacy transformed from keeping a low profile to striving for achievements. And General Secretary Xi Jinping said this in 2014 with regard to propaganda when he said directly, we should increase China's soft power, give a good Chinese narrative, and better communicate Chinese messages to the world. Since he did that, China's propaganda apparatus has been in overdrive to accomplish this objective. Now, importantly, in the 2000s and, and when we wrote this book, I don't believe that this propaganda effort was inherently anti-American. At least it wasn't at that stage. But this kind of soft balancing has evolved. And now China is directly confronting and disparaging the United States and its propaganda. This is one reason why I cannot be optimistic about a U.S.-China rapprochement because the nature of their propaganda includes a deeply inherently anti-US element, which would have to be removed in order for a rapprochement to take hold. So now we see an increasingly anti-US focused approach. One quote, for example, many in Beijing now believe that the obstacles to justice and peace are the hegemonism, power politics, and the self-serving behavior of a few Western states led by the United States. And in 2021, at the Forum for Democracy held in Beijing, the vice chair of the uh, propaganda department, excuse me, the director of the propaganda department, Huang Kunming, said he contrasted America's decline with CPC's what he called relentless to commitment to China's socialist democracy, which he held up as the broadest, most genuine, most effective type of democracy. So this of course, underscores the point you're making, this muddying of the waters in terms of what is democracy. Now, the report then goes into four key elements. Those key elements, which I'll, I'll list for you briefly, and you can look at them yourself, are the official and unofficial news outlets that China has. Xinhua is the leader in this, but we have CGTN, China Daily, and CRI. These are, uh, we can call them the big four. At least that's what they call them. And again, Xinhua has, according to their website, 37 bureaus in Africa right now, right? 37. That should give you, I wonder, I don't know exactly how many Reuters has, but it's a lot less than that, right? Moreover, Star, uh, Star Times, which is a cable network, has over 13 million subscribers in 30 African countries. And a variety of different apps have evolved in the continent, including one called Opera, which now has, according to their website, over 200 million African users. Um, so China has both these official outlets with the traditional propaganda, as well as more softer approach that they're also promulgating. Now, within its approach, it has an editorial process, an editorial line. And that editorial line is led from Beijing, but, every, but all of these African bureaus have representatives of the propaganda department, which communicate with their colleagues and help to ensure that the party line is towed. And Africans who work in these agencies must, of course, abide by the editorial line as part of their employment. The third is content localization. In English, I think we call this astroturfing, right? Where you make something look like it's grassroots, but it's really planted from above. This includes hiring African journalists and editors, a lot of content sharing agreements, some of which we don't even know about, and, and sub agreements where you'd have a larger African entity using material and then providing it to a sub-regional entity. So you'd have a kind of passing down to the point where at one point you don't know where the original source of the information actually came from. And at that point, you've actually achieved the objective, right? You've nested it so deeply into African society, you don't know where the narrative originated. China is also working with African outlets, and it's using equity purchases of certain outlets in Africa to expand its influence. And then finally, it's hosting and training African media. And prior to COVID-19, there were dozens of African journalists going to, Af going to China every year to learn the Xinhua style and to develop 
notions of journalism akin to China's. Some of the topics taught, some of the names of these courses that I found were, this is a quote, China's experience and the achievements on economic reform and national development, the Taiwan question, China's journalistic view and the operation of the Chinese press. So you can see here that nested into these training, this isn't merely how to work a camera. This is how to emulate the Chinese system. So how effective have these efforts been? Well, the information here is mixed. We have no doubt that there are dozens of Africans around the continent who are promulgating Chinese propaganda, advancing the message further. We call these the friends of China. And in every country, you'll find a few. In some countries, such as Kenya, Ghana, and Malawi, research suggests that Chinese media is actually making inroads. Still, there's reason to not overstate the case. According to research, Chinese sources appear to be less influential than British and French outlets, but more influential than U.S. outlets. According to the research that I found in 2021, roughly 2% 2 of Kenyans and 2% of South Africans listened to China Radio International or Red China Daily. So a very, very small amount. Now, the people who read this like China better. So it's successful in the sense that if you read the stuff, you like China better, but very few people are reading it. African views of China on the continent are generally positive. Afrobarometer reports, as do others. However, the most recent online surveys suggest that China is not as popular as the United States, which is interesting given the fact that they've invested so much and we've invested so little. We have a bipartisan disregard for Africa in our foreign policy, but yet we are equal or better, according to the recent surveys, than China. And this gives us, I think, some important hope. So in conclusion, and then turning to our, our panel then, the evidence on the effectiveness of China's propaganda approach in Africa is mixed. Although Beijing has cultivated dozens of influential African interlocutors, and surveys suggest that China is viewed generally favorably, Beijing's official media outlets have low levels of viewership. There's little overlap between them and the most interesting and important issues for Africans on the continent. Um, and there is an opportunity here for the United States to advance its interests on the continent and defend itself from what would be a disinformation uh, promulgated against it. So thank you guys so much. And maybe I can invite our panelists on stage. And so uh, we're going to have a, uh, a panel here, uh, as you know, and then uh, Henry is going to mediate the panel. So if you could give us a second to uh, please join me on stage. And I think Ambassador Mitchell will take his leave. Thank you so much. All right, guys. Do you want to sit in the middle, maybe? Uh, yeah, I think you two can sit in those two. Okay. okay, all right. Okay. Yeah. Just turn this on. Let me turn the microphone off. Okay. All right. Do you want to slide over one? I want to slide over You didn't want to be on No, no, we're okay. I, you've heard enough from me. I'm here from you now. You've got to earn that sandwich. That's great. Yeah. Right, well, uh, is the mic working? Good, thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's um, clear that there is a lot more to talk about than uh, what you can say in five minutes, uh, especially given that I'm sure a lot of this is feeding into your upcoming book. So uh, I think what we're, we're gonna do next is uh, prompt a few questions from Josh uh, bring in the reflections of uh, uh, the, the panelists who have worked on this topic from other perspectives. Uh, and then uh, I'll, I'm aiming to defend as much time as possible for the audience to ask uh, questions and answers. And we've got some uh, questions that have been asked online that have just been handed to me as well. So I'll, mm -hmm. I'll intersperse those. But I'll, if I could just kick off. Um, you've given us an insight on the tools and techniques that China is using. Uh, you've uh, uh, focused a lot on um, uh, uh, the, the, the organs through which it operates, the, the way that that's landing. But I was curious if you could just tell us a bit more about um, uh, how does it actually impact uh, US interests or activities in the region? And uh, do you have any thoughts on how the US could respond to campaigns like this? 
Yeah, thank you, Henry. And of, and of course, this is in, in, in the report in much greater depth. But um, in the report, we go into two uh, approaches, right? One is to counter the disinformation, right? So as I mentioned in my opening remarks, increasingly, China is targeting the US. And it hadn't as much before. And this requires a pushback. At least the United States needs to at least advocate the truth, right? It cannot allow China to define itself on the continent. Um, if it does, then it will have to live in that world. So it's very important to uh, for the United States to work with uh, social media companies, but also to harness the power we already have and the institutions we already have, uh, like VOA and others, who are not spending sufficient quantities of their resources targeting Africa, right? If you look at the percentage, and the percentages are in the report, you can see Africa is simply not a priority um, for, for VOA and for the U.S. government. And so the first thing we need to do is prioritize Africa, mm -hmm. and then we need to spend the resources to define ourselves and our own narrative on the continent. Um, the second thing, uh, and this is the second part of the, the recommendations in the report, are to support independent African media and news outlets, to, to not go in, because look, we are not a country which can go in and define the narrative, and we don't want to. We don't have a propaganda department. So, and even if we, if we did, it would be un-American. So what we want to do is support independent African outlets to do their own work and to check their own leaders and to... Uh, observe the, the, the Chinese relationship um, in their own way. And we want to be able to provide them the resources they need to do the investigative journalism, to hire the uh, people they need so they don't have to rely on Xinhua press reports. Um, and so I think that these two-pronged approach, right, defending American interests, making sure we're not being disparaged, at least uh, uh, making sure we're advocating our own interests, and then ensuring that Africans um, have an independent voice and are not uh, becoming kind of looped into the Xinhua approach uh, that China is promulgating. Thank you. And if I could push you a little bit more on on, uh, on that American approach and uh, why that matters. I mean, obviously, you, you spoke about the fourth estate and it's um, the media is often regarded as a key pillar of a democracy, right? It's, it's seen as um, uh, key to ensuring accountability and transparency. Uh, and of course, by nature, by uh, there's a the, I, I imagine there's a there's a tension for us to uh, be promoting tools to support independent media without necessarily pushing our own messages on. Uh, I was wondering if, if you had any thoughts about that sensitivity from the US perspective, how, how policymakers might think about countering uh, disinformation without wading into similar waters. Uh, and then just to add to that, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on uh, how do you do that in countries where um, there is less press freedom? Uh, is it, um, it, it's obviously a different ball game. Well, maybe I could uh, punt on the second question because I think our panelists may have more thoughts on this than our, uh, some really great contributions on this one. Um, you know, I think that the key is perhaps keeping an arm's length distance between the US government and that independent institution in Africa that you're funding, right? So if you're gonna provide money for Africa Check to mm -hmm. do fact checking, which is one thing the report recommends, you, you have to do that and let them do their job, right? Mm -hmm. you, you can't have your fingers in the pie after the fact and then saying, well, you know, you were too harsh on us. Right? You, you need to kind of keep an arm's length distance. And the same thing with supporting um, Africans uh, who want to come to the U.S. to study journalism or to have internships and these kinds of things, which the report also suggests. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the report is, is pretty clear on this, that if the U.S. government does want to sponsor some scholarships for Africans, it should do that through universities. It should allow universities like Notre Dame to accept the students we want mm -hmm. and then to transfer those funds through the university. So there is an arm's length relationship here. And the reason is because in China, that's the opposite of the way it works, right? In China, they intentionally find the elites and they intentionally recruit the elites, right? And the point is to have that influence over them, mm -hmm. all right? And so our goal in part should be to counter that by not doing it, but by actually doing the opposite of it which I think would be actually, uh, my hunch is more effective than trying to a more ham-fisted or heavy-handed approach. So I think that that's the key, right? To keep that arm's length distance, have the resources available, but then let the experts do their job and not have the government too much involved. Thank you, thank you. And I'm gonna ask you one more question and then I'm gonna start prompting the panel for some of their reflections. But yeah. just before we leave, you left a, a, a tantalizing question hanging in your, in your presentation. Uh, you were talking about uh, uh, the conclusions and how actually, you know, despite these investments and despite all of these tools that um, China's been leveraging, it's not quite landing the blows that it might hope to be landing in this space. 
And I was curious how you think of that. Um, why isn't it working uh, in the way that they might hope? Uh, and uh, are there any particular examples you've come across where perhaps it is more successful that we might be more aware of? So I think we all know that under Xi Jinping, China has tightened up considerably. Um, you know, for example, prior to Xi Jinping, there was a kind of effort you would have uh, people in one province who would say a journalist in one province would get information. They didn't want to publish it locally, so they would transfer it. And there was kind of an effort to, you know, there was a pushback, if you will, from the grassroots journalism in China. But all of that has more or less been shut down. And I think that this has had effect on China's external facing propaganda as well, which means the editorial line that I mentioned, number two on the list, has expanded and become more uh, 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 penetrating, right? Um, and things that used to be okay are no longer okay. Mm -hmm. And so this is expanding, again, from the domestic into the international, right? It's the same party, the party controls both. Um, and so it's quite natural this expansion is happening. Um, you also have more, uh, more personnel, more money going into the propaganda uh, work, right? So at the same time, they're receiving more resources. They're not necessarily converting those resources into listeners because, and I think that the research shows that they're not necessarily talking about the issues that Africans care most about. Mm -hmm. And I think Professor Plummer uh, knows more than I do on that subject as to why they're doing that. So we can, um, anxious to hear her thoughts. Um, in terms of areas they are being effective, um, I mean, I, I, I think that China's building of infrastructure in Africa with loans almost entirely has been effective in terms of building hard items that you can look at and say, that's a contribution right there, mm -hmm. right? Whereas if the United States, let's just say we, we, we bring in kind of antiretroviral drugs or these kinds of things, it may not be as obvious. So I think where China's been successful is in constructing and building things that are meeting the needs of the elites and the leaders of that country, good or bad, um, and doing things that people can see and they can say, you know, that's something that China did for us. And whether or not they know about the loans that they're going to be paid back in infinite, I mean, that's a different story. But they can see the stadium, right? And I think that has been, that's been very effective, um, at least from my perspective. Yeah. Well, yeah, please. Yeah. So um, I just want to echo um, Josh, Josh's sentiment that when we look at public diplomacy and propaganda, we can't delink it from the economic activities that are happening on the ground. They're interlaced. So when we think about you know propaganda, the engagements with different publics, you have image cultivation. China, of course, wants to have a positive image. Um, among Kenyan publics, the Kenyan elite, the business sector, mar market women, fishers, everyone. But there's also um, reputation management. And there's a bit of a disconnect, especially if folks you know, have um, some questions about the economic activities. If people feel that you know, the infrastructure is coming at too high a cost, if people feel displaced because of imports from China, if um, people are nervous about migration, right? So there are other issues happening that inform how China engages these narratives. Um, so when we look at the messages, you asked, you know, why aren't the messages uh, resonating? I think there are problems with the messages, right? Um, I would dare say that these messages are very Sinocentric. They're not very African-centered in terms of um, China, even though China says, oh, you know, it's about friendship, goodwill, we're partners, you know, we have similar histories, we have similar destinies. What people see on the ground and what they experience is a bit different, mm -hmm. right? Um, people um, may be more skeptical of, you know, foreign actors, this new foreign actor operating in their space. And there may be more questions um, that people have um, that aren't being answered by the messages that are uh, being communicated. Um, people are very sophisticated. People can see through, you know, <laughs> propaganda on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that begs the question, who is the propaganda really targeting? Mm -hmm. On an elite level, you know, on the level of the private sector, the level of ordinary people? I think it becomes a bit more complicated in terms of um, who the intended audience is and whether or not they're being reached. Mm -hmm. can, can I push you to speak a bit more about that actually on, based on your own research? So yeah. you've, 
you've obviously worked on different forms of messaging within Kenya specifically. You worked on uh, Chinese Confucius Institutes, um, obviously on your book on discourses. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, how do you, at least in the Kenyan uh, case study, yeah. uh, how do you view Chinese messaging through uh, local media compared with other forms of uh, Chinese uh, influence campaigns through um, uh, Confucius Institute or, or, or trade bodies or whoever? Yeah, well, Josh was absolutely right. There's a whole toolkit that right. the Chinese state uses to engage different audiences. So the Confucius Institutes, for example, um, these are educational institutions set up in a foreign country or hosted by a foreign country, and they're intended to reach mostly students, you know, um, but they're intended to reach publics, right? Not necessarily people in the government or people on the elite level. Um, and it's not particularly creative, you know, there's the Goethe Institute, the Cervantes Institute, you know, this is just one of the tools that um, uh, diplomatic corps have. Um, so even with the Confucius Institute, it's a very narrow group <laughs> that they tend to target. It's folks within universities who want to learn Mandarin. Um, however, it's linked to what you said in terms of targeting mm -hmm. elites you know, at the university level that they can cultivate, perhaps provide a scholarship later, perhaps these people uh, may be upward rising within a society. So they're trying to target, you know, promising um, young, not only Africans, their Confucius Institutes globally, including here in the United States, mm. to help shape their perception of Africa. So hopefully mm. <laughs> they will lend themselves to um, African ideas and values, you know, mm. as they perhaps move up the leadership um, chain. So yes, they do engage traditional media sources um, through op-eds, which your um, report looks at. But what's interesting is social media spaces, we talk about the fourth estate, but the digital estate is very powerful, especially among young people on mm -hmm. the continent, mm -hmm. especially in Kenya. This estate, I think we need to look at more. I find that Chinese state actors tend to be very reactive on social media, specifically Twitter and Facebook, mm -hmm. they're reacting to what people are saying on the ground, right? So if people are like, hey, you know, why is it that I don't have a job on this infrastructure project when I have the skills? They go to social media, there's discourse on social media, and then the print media may pick it up. Mm -hmm. And then someone from the embassy may respond to it. Um, and then it may actually get news coverage. So it's interesting how the ecosystem works mm -hmm. that before social media, ordinary people may not have the space or opportunity to engage in these discourses and actually have government officials respond to them. So I think there's a lot of power there that um, the US government needs to look at. Social media spaces as this new terrain that we need to figure out if there are opportunities to you know, influence or shape narratives and messages there. China's doing it. Chinese state actors are doing it. They're not that sophisticated, uh, but they're there, mm -hmm. which I think is really important. Social media is pay for play, right? Yeah. And we need to be able to accept the reality of yeah. that and be willing to, you know, get into the game. But I think when you asked about what was successful, I do think, and, and I'm curious if you guys would agree, that the, the Confucius Institutes in Africa, especially in Kenya, have been quite successful, maybe more so than in other countries. I, 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 every case by case, perhaps, but I, I have heard in South Africa and other places of successful uh, uh, efforts. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's how you measure success, right? Mm -hmm. So the Confucius Institute has been very successful in establishing a physical presence in Nairobi. Mm -hmm, yeah. I mean, it's amazing the ground that they've gained on the University of Nairobi's campus, mm -hmm. um, where space is very limited. And on social media, there was a lot of discord among students and faculty around the Confucius Institute. It was yeah. this whole thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, an instructor was on YouTube. He was caught complaining about how he didn't have a classroom to teach his class. Yet he said, look at the Confucius Institute. They have all this physical space to teach their classes. And he says at one point, am I supposed to teach my students up under a tree? So that's what I mean. Yeah. You know, we have to look at how we measure success, right? So yeah. it's successful in that they have this big, beautiful building. They're employing people. Yes, they're students. But I interviewed students who said, listen, we're trying to get a scholarship to go to China, right? Mm -hmm. They have their own personal interests. Mm -hmm. And the students say, we don't gain enough skills because the curriculum 
is not what it should be. We don't have enough skills to be able to get a job as an interpreter after going through the Confucius Institute. We know we have to go to China. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean where, yes, it looks great on the surface, but how are students using that for their own career goals? They're using it in very strategic ways and it makes a lot of sense, but um, it all depends on the Confucius Institute. Yeah. I find the director is very important. Oh, I mean, yes. Absolutely. You a, a, I mean, it's almost like anything. You get a good leadership and you can do yeah. a lot. Oh, yeah. It's true on social media, too. You see different um, embassies have very different approaches to social media. In some cases, in Kenya, I think they've been, the Chinese embassy has been particularly adroit at mm -hmm. responding to social media comments. And others, you see, even if they've established a presence on Twitter, they're very limited, very careful in what they say. Mm -hmm. yeah. so it really depends. I wonder why that is. Sometimes we, in our report on the same topic, yeah. sometimes we tracked that the embassy's behavior, you could see it changing with different ambassadors coming yeah. in. Mm -hmm. It's a very top down. Well, so on that report, actually, Ali, so you, you, you've obviously looked at uh, Chinese media uh, campaigns around the world. I'm just curious, you know, uh, based on what uh, Josh has been presenting this afternoon and based on what, he, what he's written, I'm, I'm curious if you could contextualize a little bit how um, Chinese media campaigns in Africa might compare with Chinese media campaigns in other parts of the world and uh, why it matters, basically. Yeah, um, thanks for that question. Um, and I mean, I think it is, you know, we, we Freedom House published a report in September um, with 30 country case studies, including so, um, six or seven in Africa. And so I think it is important to note that, you know, like, you know, your your report did a great job of sort of covering the various ways in which China attempts to influence the media environment in Africa, but that's not just happening in Africa. It's happening around the world. Um, the tactics that they're using to do so are becoming increasingly sophisticated. In a lot of ways, they are expanding in many languages and succeeding at, you know, sort of reaching new audiences. Um, and it's not just sort of these positive efforts to influence media narratives, but we're also seeing sort of increasing um, censorship and efforts to sort of negatively um, silence critical coverage as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, in Africa, I think you have seen this, the start of this really interesting um, development just in the past few years of increasingly anti-U.S. narratives that's going on in other countries. Um, and it's paralleling this effort to sort of build this narrative of global of of solidarity with the global south, right? Which, um, which can you know, which which can be questioned and can and and a lot of that is due to a lack of um, information available on on how China functions and a lack of knowledge on um, domestic CCP politics as well as ex, as well as sort of their external tactics that they're and their external um, priorities. Um, one thing that I want to highlight that we sort of tried to look at in our uh, in our report, and that is maybe a cause for hope, is that you are also seeing increasing pushback um, at the local level um, against you know Beijing's efforts to influence media. So you're seeing things like the Kenyan Media Council um, publicly rebuking a broadcaster for pushing Chinese propaganda, or you're seeing things like editors in newsrooms in Senegal who were very selective, even though they had partnerships with Chinese state media outlets, they were very selective in the content that they were taking. So like they would not take political content, but they would take news reporting on like sports events. Um, and I think it's important to have that sort of like, to acknowledge that role of the local agency that you were sort of mentioning, and that this is both a massive effort, but to really look at the impact, you have to look at how at a very individual level or a very country specific level, different places are responding to it. Thank you. Well, uh, if it's all right, I think I'm going to start jumping into some of the online questions because otherwise um, yeah. they can get left behind. So I, I'm going to group three together uh, and, and send them your way, Josh. Oh, okay. Uh, so the first is okay, from sure. Nicholas Cook from the Congressional Research Service saying, please, can you discuss the relationship between the Chinese Communist Party's specific efforts, e.g. the United Front and broader PRC state media outlets? Uh, the next is by Clement Aduku at Palmas Academy and Continuing Education Research Institute, asking, uh, uh, starting by saying, China's growing influence in Africa and by extension the Global South is enormous. Does this 
uh, strategic rivalry with the US help Africa develop in any way? Uh, and then we've got a question from our friend uh, Cliff Mboya uh, saying uh, uh, from the uh, China Global South project uh, asking, uh, saying, China has resorted to accusing the United States of double standards and doing the same things or worse than what Beijing is doing. The debt trap narrative and negative portrayal of Africa in Western media has been cited as examples. Do you think the US is aiding China's cause by it, uh, its own inconsistencies? Ooh, a couple of easy ones. Um, okay. <laughs> so, the, so the first question, CPC specific efforts in the United Front. Can you, can you repeat that one? Because I Absolutely. didn't get that one. So uh, he was asking basically for the distinction between CCP efforts, such as the United Front, with broader PRC state media outlet efforts. So I think he was thinking. Um, OK. Um, so as I mentioned in my introductory remarks, the book goes into three different types of propaganda, at least that's the way we group it. Media propaganda, educational propaganda, and cultural propaganda. Um, and the cultural propaganda and the educational propaganda are usually, China calls them people-to-people -people relations. That's their nomenclature for it. And so that has a lot of overlap and connection to the United Front Work Department and has a lot of connection um, to other kind of foreign-focused groups within China. Um, and so I, my understanding of it, and I'm very interested to hear from the other panelists if they see it differently, is that the media-focused propaganda work tends to be dominated by the big four, and then you've got these kind of semi-official uh, uh, places that I talked about before, which are kind of private, but then have kind of Beijing's implicit backing uh, online uh, uh, apps and social media, et cetera. Um, my understanding is that those are not directly connected to the United Front Work Department, that they come under the auspices of the propaganda department. However, the uh, Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Culture, and the United Front Work Department all have some hand in these educational and cultural exchanges, such that that part of propaganda, I would say there's probably more overlap. However, I wouldn't sit here and say, I know for sure that the United Front Work Department hasn't had meetings about media. I'm sure at some level they have. I'm sure at some level they have been a part and a discussion with their comrades, you know, because these are colleagues, right? These are people who hold the same card. They're all members of the party. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's almost certain that they have had those communications. But when it comes to the responsibility for these particular areas, I see the United Front Work Department is primarily in this educational and cultural sphere. Mm. Um, but again, I'm very curious to see if, if you all hear it the same. Um, I mean, you gave me three questions here. You want me to tear through all of them? Or maybe we can go to them on this one and then... Whatever you want, you're the little bit. Sure. So I, 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 I'd like you to test through all of them. Oh, but okay. I will, so I, I, will, I, will here, happily, <laughs> I will happily bring in the panelists for their reflections. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, the second one is, does China help Africa at all? Is that the, the, does the strategic rivalry offer opportunities for African countries? Mm -hmm. Now, this is funny because Ambassador Shin and I heard this in Sudan in 2007, right? We would, we would come and say, well, how can China and the U.S. collaborate to help Sudan? And the answer was, you can't. Don't. We will play you off each other. That's the best for us. Mm. And, that, and I was like, okay, all right, maybe we're not in a position to work with China. And, and as you know at USIP, extensive efforts were made, some of which I was a part of for years, to reach out to the Chinese side to come up with ways where we could work together in Africa, right? To my knowledge, and you could speak more definitively, none of that was like came to any outcomes that are tangible, but maybe I'm wrong on that. So the upshot is, can the US and China come together to help Africa? I don't think so. At least as the US and China rivalry gets worse, it seems that collaboration becomes less and less likely. So then that refers back to the Sudan scenario, which is, does our rivalry provide opportunities for Africans to say, for example, if we take some of the guidance that I put into the report, if we do open opportunities for African students to come to the US to study uh, journalism, hypothetically, that would, if, if that is done in response to China, that's a new opportunity that that African person would not have had, that they might have gone to Africa, excuse me, China, or they may have gone nowhere. But instead, they will come to the United States and go to you know, Notre Dame or Columbia or wherever to study journalism. And so ultimately, maybe there are some folks who will benefit as we prioritize Africa more in response to China. However, we also need to be careful. We don't want Africa to be simply a playing field for our rivalry, where Africa becomes nothing more than a place where we squabble. And if that happens, then I don't think Africa is going to win. So the question is, it's, it's about how we do this rivalry. 
right? Um, are we going to go back to where we were in the 70s, where we're f supporting rival groups and, and think, you know, if we're doing that, I don't think that's helping. But if we can come together and say, okay, you do your media training and we're going to do ours and, and we'll have that, I think that mm -hmm. could benefit some Africans. Um, and the third question is uh, U.S. aiding China by calling out China. Is that the... Just sort of, he's key? saying, he said, he's pointing out that uh, Beijing accuses the U.S. of doing the same thing with debt trap, de debt trap narratives and negative portrayals uh, of Africa in Western media. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he says, do you think that the U.S. is aiding China by its own inconsistencies? So there's... It's, yeah. Um, well, I guess, to my knowledge, and, and this is not a report on economics, the U.S. does not have substantial loans in Africa. We're just not do for good or bad. You could criticize it, and you could say we should. Or you, I'm not going to get into that. But I'm going to say we do not have a debt trap diplomacy because we don't have debt. Where if for anything we have grants, and maybe they're insufficient. But my understanding is that we don't have enough debt to be accused of that in a way that actually would stick. In terms of the negative perceptions of Africa, I think this is undoubtedly true. But we also always have to remember the old saying, right? If it bleeds, it leads, right? Media in this country cover things that are negative because that is what is going to get your clicks, right? I don't have to tell you guys how this works, right? So the Chinese Communist Party's internet, I mean, excuse me, uh, Xinhua News Agency can spend its money saying Africa's great, everything's great, everything's great all the time because they have an unlimited source of funds from the Chinese taxpayers to support their efforts. If you're Reuters or Bloomberg or whomever and you actually have to sell content, you can't just put out a bunch of cheerleading content. You actually need something substantive and often that ends up being negative. So yes, in the United States, we have a, a, a we don't know enough about Africa. What we do know about Africa is overwhelmingly negative. In part, that's because of bias and prejudice and racism. Part of it is systemic, that we don't have enough uh, resources, as I said during the uh, uh, 2009, uh, 8, 9 uh, economic crisis, we pulled out a lot of resources. So we don't know what we don't know. We don't know a lot, right? And they double down. And so I do think um, in this sense, Part of it's the response of who we are as a, as a society that we cover the negative, right? About ourselves as well, right? Um, the China Daily is just simply a different kind of newspaper than the New York Times, ultimately, is the answer to the question. Did you want to jump in on any of these responses? I saw you nodding a lot and... Uh. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think it, I think Josh is right on. Um, the issue is, is that the U.S. does not have the same policy approach that Beijing has in Africa. You talk to the typical person in Africa, they say, we don't want aid, we want trade. We want to be able to develop on our own. We want to be able to have the tools, the capital we need to develop. China's not doing that, but they're, you know, helping with infrastructural development. Now they're engaged in these public-private partnerships, which we don't quite know what that's going to look like. They are making investments. The U.S. just hasn't done that yet. So um, our narratives aren't as strong because they're not, we don't have the dollars backing up the narratives, right? In terms of having African-centered development that is sustainable. Um, so on an elite level, you're absolutely right. Um, the former president of Kenya, Uhuru Kenyatta, was at the Atlantic Council a few years ago, and he said, Africa is not going to be a Cold War playing ground. We're not going to enter into this new Cold War phase because he said we're at the table, meaning mm -hmm. African elites are at the table. And that's where we have to be very careful and understand that <clears throat> what happens at the elite level may not necessarily translate or trickle down to what's happening at the grassroots level. Um, so when elites are say, hey, we're at the table, we're negotiating things, we are going to pit China against the U.S., which we have seen, you know, with financing in the past, especially with the international finance institutions, we have to be very careful to know that the typical person may not benefit from whatever is being negotiated in a boardroom, right? Um, so I'm nervous about this, this rivalry and how it will impact local communities who are pushing for transparency. Um, because I can tell you one thing, with this propaganda, the antidote to disinformation, misinformation and propaganda is what you say in your report, is more investigations, more journalists who are empowered to uncover what's happening, um, especially as it relates to China's uh, 
economic interventions on the continent. Um, we have to trust people in Africa to be able to, you know, set the agenda, people especially on the grassroots, set the agenda and push their governments to be more responsive to them and uh, more responsive to the, the needs of the masses of people as they engage with China and the U.S., right? So that question really resonates, this idea that, you know, yeah, the U.S. needs to step up in terms of providing sustainable economic alternatives to China and not just aid, right? Thank you. Well, I think uh, we've reached a good moment to start uh, yeah. going to the audience. So uh, we'll start with you, and then we'll go to you, and then. Yeah, we can take two at a time if you want, yeah. just to make sure. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. And please introduce yourself. Uh, I'm your a Peter Humphrey, an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. I think a key policy recommendation is missing. Um, we have failed 100% to educate the uh, Muslim majority nations in Africa about what's being done to Muslims in China. Mm -hmm. The brutalization of Muslim people, the bulldozing of hundreds of religious facilities, and ultimately criticism of Islam itself in all media, especially textbooks. If you don't shine a, a Klieg light on that throughout uh, Muslim Islam, uh, Africa, you have failed in your greatest opportunity. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm Ben Miles with the uh, Department of Commerce, um, International Trade Administration. I kind of wanted to circle back to what the panel was saying about um, we need trade, not aid. Uh, and I wanted to ask a question. So, you know, in, in your policy recommendations, how would you say that organizations like the ITA um, can combat this in their own way? Uh, the International Trade Administration is dedicated to export promotion, but commercial diplomacy more broadly. And um, I guess I'd be interested in knowing how you may see us playing a role in that uh, in that mission to try to advance U.S. interests, but also to assist Africa in combating this kind of malign influence. I suppose you could say, um, yeah. So thank you. Maybe I can take the first. Yeah, who would like to? Yeah. Question, just because it's directly yeah, specific yeah. to the report. Um, I completely agree. Um, in, in, in the report uh, recommendation section, you might note that we don't mention any specific issue. It's all about the how, right? How to do that, right? And then uh, I believe, and I, and I have said actually publicly before, that this should be a main effort of it. But as you see in the report, we don't go into any specific issue. However, I agree with you 100%. And it would seem like it makes a lot of sense, especially because China has been so effective in the opposite, right? Where the um, the British and the Americans, and et cetera, have gone to the UN, waved a piece of paper around and said, China's doing bad things to Muslims. All the West agrees. China has then gotten dozens of Muslim states, including many in Africa, to sign on to the fact that everything's cool, nothing's happening here. These are not the droids you're looking for. And that, I think, is is deeply problematic because you've got countries like Egypt, et cetera, who are on the record siding with China. They would have to back away from that. And I actually was in Egypt for this report and I interviewed Egyptian policymakers and I asked them, I asked them specifically, how many Muslims do they have to kill before you care? That was my question. And you know what their answer was? We don't care. We have our own extremists. This is their internal issue. It's not ours. End of the question. Next question, right? So. The answer, I guess, is we could do it. I think this goes to Professor Plummer's point about the grassroots. We could, I think, speak to the grassroots and get them to push up. But I think that efforts to engage elites on this issue have fallen 100% flat. So we are, you know, but how to do that, right? And we haven't created the facilities to engage at the grassroots level. So after we create the infrastructure that I'm trying to advocate we do, I think this should be the first topic we should do, but without the infrastructure, we don't have we, we don't have the capacity to do it. And I think that's why we failed in the way that, that you've mentioned. Now, um, you had mentioned the trade versus aid. So, do you want to take yeah, this? Sure. Uh, uh, so, I think the U.S. And I'm going to link it to the report, so we don't talk about you know economic issues. 
we have an asset in this country that China doesn't have, and that's black people. Mm -hmm. Seriously, I mean, we can speak as people, as black folk, whether it's the new diaspora or the old diaspora, with a different level of credibility than white folk. So when we talk about trade, um, I think we need to promote efforts that encourage, you know, minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, and invest in connections with U.S. companies and African-based companies. Um, and we really need to promote the transatlantic ties um, of black entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. I think that will really resonate, especially amongst young people on the continent, young entrepreneurs. And it's, to me, it's a no brainer, but I'm always shocked that it's like, oh, when we think of the diaspora, we think first, second generation African immigrants, but we're not thinking about how to engage um, the old diaspora in how we speak to African audiences. Um, so that's just my two cents, trying to connect it um, again to you know our tools that we're not using <laughs> as we should. One quick point on the trade, Ben. The in a place like Kenya, what do you do? You know off the top of your head what the trade imbalance is? It's like ninety five percent in so one direction, right? Yeah. It, it makes our trade imbalance with China look like you know yeah. percentage wise, okay, look like not a big deal. And there are numerous African countries, many, the majority of them, that have these enormous trade deficits with China. Mm -hmm. So the idea that you would say trade not aid, no, that makes sense when there's somewhat balanced trade. But at this point. You're putting African fishermen out of business. You're putting African entrepreneurs out of business. You're cannibalizing the local textile markets, right? And you're undermining, in many ways, the economy through trade, right? So you don't want to do trade aid when you're basically undermining the African economy. And a lot of this stuff, especially um, you know, things like textiles and other, have had a really detrimental effect. So, you know, and also we have to keep in mind, markets are different in terms of you get a choice. We all get a choice when we go to the store what we want to buy. Right. So China has tried in some ways to mitigate the trade deficit. But, you know, if, if, ever, if Chinese consumers don't want to buy a product or uh, the Chinese or they're not able to get it into the market and not get the shelf space, I mean, getting shelf space in a Chinese store is notoriously hard, even when you have all the resources to throw at the problem. Forget it. If you're like, a, a, you know, a, a African beef farmer in Namibia. Right. So I think that it's all trade versus aid sounds good, but trade deficits have a you know, sustained long-term political negative consequence. Hey, they have in this country, right? So African, no different in that case. No. And I will also say something that the U.S. can do differently is really engage with the new free trade area in Africa in a different way than China is. They, China will not negotiate blocks in terms of trade agreements. And with AGOA, we already know that the U.S. is willing to engage in um, pan-African policy. So I think the U.S. really needs to think through how we're going to help support the free, um, uh, the African free trade area in a sustainable way. Yeah. So it's not necessarily cross-Atlantic trade, right? But how are we supporting intra-African trade? Um, and investment is the other one. Mm -hmm. So trade is one thing, investment is the other. Mm -hmm. I, I, Thank uh, you very much. I, Ellie, I wanted to give you a chance if uh, you've got some you wanted to respond to any of these. Oh, I mean... <laughs> I guess I would say on the um, on what you mentioned about the need to sort of better um, better inform people about what's happening in Xinjiang and China's sort of very targeted persecution of ethnic minorities. Um, I think, you know, I want to push back on that a little bit and and note that international media um, and a lot of international advocacy groups have actually done a really good job of providing you know, a ton of evidence about that, including first person testimonials and things like that, that's been picked up. And we have seen that that has been sort of, you know, when individual news outlets um, in Muslim majority countries might not have the ability to conduct that deep investigative reporting on their own, but they can you know, republish articles from New York Times about the Xinjiang papers or something like that. So that information we have seen is still reaching local audiences. It may not have an impact on political elites who've sort of already made their decision, but we have seen some pushback from civil society organizations, um, Muslim civil, civil society groups that are trying to raise awareness about this in their own countries as well. Yeah, thank you. I saw you had a couple over here as well. Excellent, we'll start here. Okay, um, 
thank you for interesting debate. My uh, name is uh, Eva Sojkova. I'm a Fulbright Fellow at SAIS. Um, I was uh, wondering uh, if there is some difference based on the based on the different techniques uh, of propaganda of media propaganda China is using based on the type of regime in Africa, whether we are talking about democracies like Ghana or South Africa, or like hybrid regimes like uh, like um, Ethiopia, for instance, does it differ? And um, I was also thinking um, what are the skills that journalists are gaining at the trainings and seminars and um, are they really transferred in in practice uh, while uh, writing about not only about china but in other topics than china in practice oh, thank you Good afternoon, Sophia Budai with Department of State Bureau of African Affairs. Um, so very much appreciate the recommendations that you have in your report. And of course, these are ongoing conversations that we have. And a lot of these, um, you know, uh, support to African journalists, we do try to implement, but our budgets for Sub-Saharan Africa are, are quite small. So what I wanted to ask you is from your perspective, uh, China ha is really fantastic um, working in this pay to play environment, as you already know, uh, mentioned, whether that's on social media or in traditional media. Whereas we as the US government have for a long time believed that we don't need to pay for what, what we put out there. Our, the strength of our ideas where it will carry us through. Uh, we can place an editorial, by our ambassador in a, in a local newspaper, if, if the editors agree, of course, but we're not going to pay for that, whereas China does. Do we need to shift our mentality at the State Department or the US government in general and really think more in terms of PR campaigns and less in terms of uh, traditional public diplomacy activities where we've tended to believe that if we go out and we talk about what we stand for, what we um, do uh, for that country, what the bilateral relationship is like, we'll, we'll win out because our ideas are better and we don't have to pay for them. Is that, is that the wrong way to think about this in the 21st century? Thank you. I'm glad Derek answered that question before the green room. Right. <laughs> One more? Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there was one over here. I thought, sorry. Uh, do you want to do two more? Or just one? Well, sorry, then if there are two more, why don't we okay. start with these two and all then right. we'll take all you right. two in the next round if that's all right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, who would like to take the question about uh, different techniques for different countries? I mean, I can take it I, or you can, or actually, why don't we let Ellie? I'm happy to start and then better. pass it over yeah, to you. Great. Yeah, I mean, I will great. preface it by saying that our. Um, our research, as much as possible, tried to look at more democratic countries. Um, but in countries where there isn't a free media environment, you know, there's less need for um, Chinese diplomats or state media to engage directly with a critical opposition voice, right? They can just publish op-eds in the state-owned paper, and that's the end of the story. Um, where there is a more sort of vibrant critical journalism, we've seen that they've been pushed to need to respond. And I think Professor Plummer can speak to that sort of the role of local agency in, 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 in these conversations and how it sort of shifted, um, shifted the debate. But. No, that was eloquent. I actually have nothing to add. You are absolutely right. <laughs> the, the only one thing I would say is that uh, I, I think when, when the country is more authoritarian, the chances of Xinhua having exchange agreements with their state media go up, I would think. Now, Ellie, you may know exactly how much it goes up, but it seems that China, the, the Xinhua feels very comfortable working with other state media outlets in other autocratic countries. Um, it will work with countries, uh, uh, media outlets in democratic countries, but it's a different kind of interaction. Um, and that's my sense. Do you? It, it'll also work pretty, I mean, again, in just in the years that we were looking at, um, we saw that they, they would sort of, they would first reach out to state media, then they would reach out to private media. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a question of resources too. Um, a lot of news outlets, you know, constantly facing financial challenges. Yeah. Um, if they are receiving free content, free high quality image content in particular, mm -hmm. um, it's hard to say no to that, you know? So finding ways in which you can sort of support them or pr provide reduced rates for getting images or something like that can also, can also help to sort of um, 
allay that media influence. Yeah, I mean, this is a, a, a suggestion in the report, yeah. right, that, w that the United States and the State Department and others provide subsidies, not to say you need to do this, but to say here's a subsidy to help you fill the gap when you don't want to take Xinhua content. So if you want AP content, we can provide a subsidy or maybe even work with AP to provide their content at a reduced rate um, to help. Uh, otherwise, you don't break into the market at all, right? Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, it's the way markets work. Sometimes you have to lower your price in order to break into the market, right? And I don't know how much these uh, news agencies are prioritizing Africa in the way that China is. Um, I thought that was a great answer as well, though. Um, 100% agree. Um, in terms of the, the, the pay for play, I think it's different when you're saying, like, come and put an insert into the newspaper and at the top it says, insert paid for by the U.S. State Department. <laughs> it's different than online kind of uh, content promotion, right? Pushing your content out there. I fully agree that we have a better product, but maybe I'm dating myself here, but do you guys remember the, the debate between VHS and Betamax? <laughs> All right, who won that? A worse product. VHS was not as good as Betamax in terms of quality, but they won. And they won because they got to the market quicker, they got to the consumer quicker, and they got that consumer to adopt the product and then create a path dependence with the product such that all they owned was VHS cassette tapes. They weren't going to buy a Betamax, except for my uncle who had to have one. So the upshot is simply because you have a better product doesn't mean you win, right? And so I do believe that at some level we have to rethink our approach and we do have to be willing, at least on social media, to put a little skin in the game and not just cross our arms and say, you know, we're smarter and better and we have a better product, so we're going to win. Because we know that markets don't work that way. So it would be hubris to think that. And so I do think we should put more resources into uh, um, not changing the message, but amplifying the message. And, and VOA, as we say in the report, has put, what, 13% of its money into Africa? It's a paltry amount, um, given the youth of the African continent. I mean, you want to speak to people who are going to be around. Um, I hate to say it like that, but this is something that we haven't prioritized, and I think we can. I also think the, and you mentioned this in your report too, that the Chinese government now has private firms mm -hmm. really developing messaging and branding. Yeah, Africa focused. Yes, yeah. Africa focused branding. Advertising, what do we call it? Public relations was pretty much created here in this country. And I don't think we're leveraging all mm -hmm. of the innovation and talent we have in terms of, you know, Ambassador Mitchell talked about how democracy, this idea has been co-opted and the language has been, well, the idea hasn't mm -hmm. been, but the language has been co-opted. I think we have to be very creative in terms of how we're engaging with yeah. the young continent who's digitally connected. I also want to say that yes, when we look at African publics, we look at constituents, we look at people, but I think China views them also as consumers. Mm -hmm. Consumers of products and consumers of ideas. So, and I'm not sounding conspiratorial here, when we look at the digital infrastructures that Huawei and other Chinese firms are building out in Africa, the cell phones, they're collecting data on people right? That's the backbone of our, mm -hmm. you know, uh, tech sector. The most valuable thing is people's data and they're collecting it. So because the state yeah. is intertwined with these private companies, this information, this data on these millions of dynamic and vibrant youth in Africa, are going to, it's going to be used to craft mm -hmm. messaging, to create consumers yeah. of Chinese products. I don't, you know, we don't approach it that way. I don't think we should. These are human beings. But, you know, as a realist, we have to understand that they're gathering information. They're looking at people's preferences, where they're located. And they're like, okay, how can we cap, how can our companies capitalize on that? Yeah. We shouldn't do that. However, that's what's being done. And it's, it's very powerful information. We don't see data yeah. and young people as power. <laughs> The young people in Africa, that data is very powerful. We mm -hmm. kind of dismiss it. Like, oh, you know, yes, the continent is a young continent, but the power and the data that is being mined from the cell phones young mm -hmm. people are using, it's going to be important currency moving forward. Mm. I will just add one comment to on the sort of question of do we need to change our strategy and tactics? Um, I think in one way, you know, we are having this conversation about Chinese media influence in Africa against a broader context where like media, independent media worldwide is facing increasing attacks. 
from domestic governments, from authoritarian governments. Um, and so the degree to which we can support you know, sustainable, independent media and provide them with resources and training to sort of develop their skills and capacity to report and do in-depth investigative journalism, do fact-checking, things like that, all that also supports this issue of countering sort of problematic, coercive media influence as well. Um, you're, you're sort of working, you're working to support the same thing. Thank you. Right, well, we've got five minutes left, so uh, we will take the last two questions, and I think these will be the final ones. So um, once we've taken these questions, if you could also think about what your final thoughts or remarks would be within that. Um, but let's start here. Hi, I'm Mike Brodo with the International Republican Institute. I wanted to ask a little bit more about the mechanisms, the best mechanisms for this t sort of capacity building for investigative journalism. Um, Dr. Eisman, you talked a little bit about keeping, you know, relations at an arm's length, especially with U.S. government funded programming. And I think that's something that we're interested in, in pursuing, uh, but there are concerns about the framing. Sometimes these uh, trainings that we are promoting end up actually undermining the exact narrative that we are countering. Um, I think there were reports a few years ago in Zimbabwe uh, pushed by the government there that the U.S. Embassy was funding a journalist to, to, to publish anti-Chinese uh, uh, news articles. So what would you recommend for building these relations? Maybe, you know, working with organizations over individuals is more of an obvious one, uh, but how to avoid not just the Chinese government uh, launching these criticisms, but also these uh, very close societies in Africa that benefit from the relations uh, with the Chinese government are and also are fearful of their citizens uh, uncovering these sorts of things. So what do you recommend? I know that the report recommends institutions like NDI and IRI pursue these things, but how would you uh, recommend avoiding that type of criticism? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Sheridan Prosso. I'm an investigative journalist at Bloomberg News. And I've looked into some of these issues myself over the years. And I'm curious about uh, the evolution of how the messages get conveyed in African media. So years ago, you would see these kind of inserts that you could just sort of pull out and wrap your fish in immediately, which is what most people did with them. Um, and they very clearly were sort of produced by the China Daily and English language and French language newspapers. Now, I guess more and more with lesions of African journalists going to China for training, are we seeing a, a more sophisticated level of integration into the actual news coverage? Are people able to differentiate something that's produced with uh, China backing or China focus in the same way that they could before when it was just an insert that you could pull out? Great. Um, how do you want to... Why don't we start with Ellie and move down? Okay. Um, uh, so responding to your question about the inserts, um, I think you are still seeing those taking place. One uh, potential issue that we flagged is that uh, label labeling advertising content is still very much poorly regulated. And when there are regulations for it, it's poorly enforced. So that's something that, you know, I think media organizations need to, including in the U.S. and in other countries, um, need to develop better sort of standards of practice for that. Um, you know, it can range from things like a very obvious China Daily insert celebrating the, you know, um, centennial of the PRC or something to, you know, a byline that I think you uh, gave this example in your report that says like Xinhua and a local news agency. But really, it's if you go online and you search it, it's like the exact Xinhua copy that's just been replicated. Right. So having a label stating clearly that this is, you know, here is the origin of the new source, like here is like it's any of its like state affiliations or anything like that is important because otherwise it's very easy for that content to just sort of um, be seen by audiences as like any sort as any other like news production that you see. Jump over me. Yeah. Okay. Oh. oh, okay. Um, so IRI. Um, you know, one thing that was really interesting in my interviews of African students in China, among them Cliff Mbaya, <laughs> is that we heard almost universally, now we're two Americans, so I understand, but when asked, why did you come to study in China for your degree, almost all of them said, because that was where I had the opportunity to study. And 
almost all of them said, had the British or the Americans offered me an opportunity, I almost certainly would have taken it. So I do think that, and maybe you kind of sit where you stand, right? So I work for a university, so it might not surprise you that I would say let the universities take the lead, right? That when it comes to educating students, that's what we do. And so the degree to which the, inf the, 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 um, uh, the funding could be provided to universities who would then be able, I mean, it would be earmarked, right? So they couldn't just use it to build a gymnasium or something. They would have to use it to bring African students in. Then that's going to create the separation. Maybe those African students don't even know they got U.S. government money. I mean, I don't know if, you know, maybe they have to know for ethical reasons. I mean, we can think of it through. But the point is that if you let private universities and, and public universities take the lead on it, you create a distance um, where China does the exact opposite, right? It comes in and says, okay, you're the daughter of so-and-so, so, oops, you're, you're going to Tsinghua University, right? And so allow, and, and, we, and also publicating, publishing this, right? So if the Chinese embassy is going to go out and push its scholarship programs, one thing we haven't done a good job of is helping Africans to understand the way America's educational system works is you have to apply and get a scholarship and, and, and reach out to them. And, you know, this is a fundamentally different type of system. No one's going to knock on your door and say, here's a scholarship to Notre Dame, right? You have to apply. But I can tell you that our MGA program, um, we have I don't, many Africans, right? I don't know the exact number. Somebody in this room might know. But um, our largest contingent of foreign students is from Africa. So it can be done. Um, but it has to be part of the plan. Um, and it does have to have, I believe, a separation because it, if you do have a, you know, pay for play, like we're going to pay you to write something negative, that has, I agree, 100, that blowback, right? You have blowback. So I hope that story was false. I hope we're not doing that. Um, I don't see how that could really serve any, any interests at all. I think we have to do what we do better. In terms of the, um, the question about uh, um, the, the content delineation, Right, and this is I mentioned astroturfing. Right, you you want it to look like natural grass, right? Um, but it's not. And I do think, and again, very interested to hear what y'all think about this. But I do think that China is getting better at this. Um, I do believe that there's increasing efforts to kind of put layers in between. So if the Xinhua story comes out, then it may come out with a kind of subheading, and then you might have a more regional media pick it up, and maybe that subheading disappears. And maybe the person who reads it doesn't even know that it had any Xinhua content initially, unless they got the search that you did with the content plugging and to see that it originally came from there. So I think that's part of the plan as well, to, to make it difficult to track the source of the information uh, back to China. And that the more that they can do that, the more those stories become part of the meta narratives that circulate the continent and are not attached to China. So I think they've been doing a better job of that. And maybe a canonical case, as I mentioned, in, is this IOL, independent, ironically, independent online media in South Africa, which is now essentially a, a, a component of the Chinese embassy um, and is involved in running nothing but Xinhua content all the time. And so they've gone and, and they even fired one of their journalists who did write a story about Xinjiang um, in 2018. So you can see that there is a kind of creeping and through um, equity investments as well, where you buy a stake um, and then you could just, you could do advertising, right? So you don't have to buy an insert. You just buy, you know, help them support their advertising budget by advertising, I don't know, Chinese tractors or whatever. And then you, what you have is, well, maybe we don't want to publish that story because it could have an effect on our ad revenue, right? So the Chinese don't have to, the Chinese government doesn't have to come in and back you over the head and say, don't publish that story, although that happens. But the fear of losing that ad revenue is enough to have you say, you know what, we've got plenty of other stories to fill that slot, mm -hmm. right? And that, and we, we would never know, right? This is what we'd call a known unknown, right? It's this thing that happened, but you know, it's a self-censorship issue. We can't know about it, right? And so I think there are many different techniques being used, um, some of which are more easily to observe than others. Thank you. Look, I'm, I'm afraid we're at time, but I, I'm going to uh, just ask Anita if you, if you had any last uh, reflections uh, since you didn't respond to the last one. Yeah. No? OK. All right. Well, uh, I would say please catch the speakers uh, afterwards. But uh, to give everybody back the rest of their day, I'm going to end it here. I'm going to say, Thank you so much to all three of you for all of this insight on this report. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for it. Really appreciate it. All right. And if now you, let's see some cherry blossoms. Let's go see some cherry blossoms. And if anybody would like to download a copy, please go to the USIP website where it should be on the front page. But if not, 
I'm sure you'll find it through uh, some deft uh, investigative journalism of your own. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Henry. Oh, of yeah. course.